Greetings fellow nerds, so I'm going to do another Q&A video. I know you're expecting an experimental video, but I got called away from the lab for a couple weeks. Now normally I would just simply not have a video, but since these Q&A videos are currently being sponsored by Pop Chest, you get to have an extra one this month. So a special thanks to Pop Chest for that. Now as you know I'm experimenting with their video sharing platform and I hope to release a video with them in February using Bitcoin. In anticipation of that, they're working with me to give away free Bitcoins to those with a Coinbase account. So if you want to test out Coinbase and Bitcoins without risking your own money, I suggest taking advantage of that. I've included links in the video description. Alternatively, if you hate Bitcoin and don't want anything to do with it, then in that case, give it all to me. I'll gladly take them off your hands. <laughs> Fools. <laughs> Wait, did I leave my phone on? Shit. Okay, let's get to questions. Wesley Gardner asks, what Fumit specifications would you recommend for amateur pyrotechnic experimentation? Typically 0.1 to 1 gram experiments. Is there a particular manufacturer you would recommend? Uh, well, let's see. I think uh, 3 feet wide by 2 feet depth and 2 or 3 feet high sounds good. As for manufacturers, they are all ludicrously overpriced for what amounts to a few dozen kilograms of steel. I can't recommend any particular one that sounds reasonable. But keep in mind, if you're just doing a dozen or so simple experiments, then it might be more straightforward to do them outside and forgo the hassle of fumud. Okay, next question. Antonio asks, Is it possible to recover pure ethanol from store-bought denatured alcohol by distillation? If not, why is it so? Depends on the particular denaturant they use. Non-volatile denaturants can very easily be separated by distillation. Volatiles are a bit more difficult as they usually select ones that don't separate easily from ethanol. So you need very long columns and extremely slow distillation times to get decent separation. For most chemistry though, it's not an issue as the detatrants are usually pretty low. Okay, Keith asks, How to remove or suppress fish smell in fish? Many sources said the cause was trimethylamine. I tried washing the fish or covering it with lemon juice. That did not work. Why? Uh, can't really help you. I know lots of chemicals that can do it, but they're all totally unsafe for human consumption. The chemicals responsible for fish odors are usually amine based, so indeed, things like vinegar, lemon juice, citric acid, or similar should work. If it's not working, you likely need more, or your fish might be in the advanced stages of decay. Okay, next question, Jason Black asks, what makes borosilicate glass so unreactive that it can contain practically any chemical reaction? What kinds of reactions aren't compatible with it? Okay, the silicon oxygen bond in glass is extremely strong and stable. A tremendous amount of energy is released when silicon combines with oxygen, so to reverse that reaction requires an equally tremendous amount of energy. There are very few other chemicals that react with silicon or oxygen that produce more stable compounds, so thus glass is very unreactive. Another factor is that glass is a network solid, so rather than individual molecules of silicon dioxide, there is a continuous network of bonds between neighboring atoms. So getting another molecule in there is difficult. And thus even when you do have something that can dissolve glass, the reaction is pretty slow and usually needs heat to get it going. Thus you can sometimes use glass dissolving chemicals in glass containers as long as they're cold and you don't leave them too long. Now borosilicate glass is used over regular soda lime glass for chemistry because borosilicate glass has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So you can heat it up and cool it down with less danger of it shattering. That being said, you should still be careful. Sometimes it does shatter. Now chemicals that dissolve glass include hydrofluoric acid as well as sodium and potassium hydroxide. In fact, I have a video where I dissolve glass with some hydroxide. I'll link that in the video description. Okay, Zach Heilman asks, Will you be doing any videos with heavier elements? The only one which comes to mind is the one where you dissolve gold to make chloroauric acid. Okay, uh, sure, why not? I might be doing lead chemistry once I figure out a way to do it safely. I was also recently given samples of chemical waste containing iridium and platinum, so I want to recover the metals from those. We'll see how things go. Ben Davies asks, what kind of legal issues have you run into whilst making your videos? Are there any banned chemicals, apart from the obvious meth, etc? Uh, let's see now, in terms of legal issues, not very much actually. Although maybe the police simply haven't gotten around to me yet. I try and dispose of my chemical waste responsibly, 
I filled the proper paperwork when ordering chemicals and I tried to adhere to local zoning laws. Another thing that works in my favor is that my channel doesn't really focus too much on explosives or any other grey area of chemistry. Sure, I do set the occasional thing on fire, but most of what I do isn't like that, so I've never had to order chemicals that would look questionable. I'm also a good enough chemist that chemicals that are otherwise restricted or otherwise more difficult to acquire, I just make myself rather than go through the extra trouble and paperwork of acquiring. There are very few chemicals that are outright banned, and I need none of them to do my work. Okay, next question, Jean-Francois Perriot asks, I need to produce more or less pure oxygen for my oxy fuel torch. Okay, and he describes why he needs it. Uh, and he suggests using an electrolysis rig. Okay, so you want to make oxygen using electrolysis. Okay, uh, rather than go through all the trouble of electrolyzing it, I think you might be better served getting something called an oxygen concentrator. They use pressure swing absorption technology to separate oxygen and nitrogen from the air to give very high concentrations of oxygen that should be good enough for your welding purposes. Look around eBay and other sites for surplus or used units. You don't need a brand new one that can give perfectly pure gas, as even a well used one will still produce oxygen pure enough for your particular needs. The energy requirements are even lower than electrolysis, and you don't produce pesky hydrogen that you have to get rid of. You might even find a use for nitrogen gas it produces to provide inert atmosphere for other projects. Okay, so that's all the questions I have for this video. Uh, as usual, if you want to ask any questions, uh, go to my Patreon feed and ask them there. Okay, so I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Take care.